and uh, and he telling of his cam of his election to the Senate, and it was very very close. And I remember calling him that night, uh, and he says, "Well, I'm I'm gone." That's what he said. I'm gone. And then he finally won. And later he told a group of us at Chowder Marching about the incident. He said that he uh, that uh, his manager told him his manager in Louisville got a call from this guy out in the mountain country. And he said, uh, tell, uh, he said, uh, how is it going down there? And he says, well, that's mighty close. And this guy in the mountain country, out in his district, said, well, you tell the senator we're praying for him. And he said, you son of a bitch, you get back to stealing and stop praying. <laughs> that's very good. It's a great story. We should tell that. I can tell that. Absolutely. Oh, I'm going to yeah. tell it. And I'll say you yes. I'll say S O B. Yeah. I think son of a bitch can be said in this program, yeah. can it? Yes. Is that done on television? Yeah. No, but uh, well, S O B. We can do S O B. We'll make we'll blaze television history. You can do either one. What's the matter with that? You can say son of a bitch. Yeah, I think. <laughs> yeah. No, I think that is done, and I think hell can be said also. Mm -hmm. like give him hell and that sort of thing. Is. But that's a great story. The way I had it a little bit. He said. You son of a bitch, stop praying and get back to stealing. Isn't that a great story? Yeah, I had not heard that before. Isn't that a great story? It's all the more reason to get these things down. Oh, yeah. I got a lot of those. I can remember if I just... <coughs> going to uh, talk a little more about sports in high school than about Harold's illnesses in Prescott, but not his death. You're not going to get to his death? No. Yet. Talk about the illnesses and going to Prescott, and then talk and about... And my uh, mother taking care of Yes, the, and mm -hmm. including the chauffeur, George the chauffeur. You want that? Oh, yes. Okay. Yeah, that's good stuff. <laughs> and then go to college, and then uh, mm -hmm. talk about Whittier, about the college, and about the courses, and about sports, and then, then come to Harold's death uh, mm -hmm. at its time. And that you had to quit uh, high school football because of, uh, that's what I'll come in on, but, uh, because, because of, of the, the having to go fear into x-ray. Yeah, yeah. Well, actually, I can say this, that they did find a scar in the lung. Hmm. But it was I from had pneumonia, pneumonia years yeah. of age. Uh, Frank, uh, you know what the football is was a handsome child, wasn't he? Mm -hmm. In uh, describing your dramatic... In uh, describing your dramatic debut, you mentioned your uh, your girlfriend Ola Florence, uh, Ola Florence Welsh. 
What? Uh, When you uh, mentioned your dramatic debut in the Aeneid, in the uh, size eight silver boots, uh, you mentioned size nine silver <laughs> boots. You mentioned your uh, girlfriend, Ola Florence Welsh. What what did it mean to have a girlfriend in Whittier, California, in 1927 or eight? What did boyfriends and girlfriends do? <clears throat> well, they didn't do what they did do today. Uh, oh. For example, uh, you go to the movies, uh, miniature golf. Uh, there, uh, there were the very simple things. Sometimes you go to the beach, you go to the mountains. Uh, uh, no drinking, uh, and in our case, no smoking. Needless to say, no pot, uh, drugs of any sort. Uh, dancing, uh, we learned to do that. Uh, me, reluctantly, she was a very good dancer. Uh, but we had a good time. We had a good time. Were they affectionate attachments, or were were they just friendships? Oh yes, they were quite affectionate. Yes, mm -hmm. that was uh, uh, despite the 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 difference in years and customs and so forth. Uh, affection was just as great in those days as it is now. Was her family a Quaker family? Oh no, her her family were Episcopalian. And uh, her father was the chief of police, not the chief, he was acting chief of police, the captain of police, actually. And they had come from Tombstone, Arizona, where he had been chief of police. Uh, he was a very well-read man. He, uh, he, he was particularly interested in psychiatry and Freud, and used to talk to the two of us about the subconscious and the unconscious, et cetera, et cetera. I never took psychology in college. Uh, but I learned to read about it because of the influence of uh, the man we called uh, Captain Welch. That was very advanced at the time, wasn't it, to be reading Freud then? Yes, it was not only advanced, it wasn't done very much in Whittier. And maybe that's one of the reasons they never made him chief of police. <laughs> you, uh, at this time, you were active in, uh, in sports in high school. The, the, the uh, high school had a, a big swimming pool and I think tennis courts. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, you played water polo, you uh, ran track. And uh, you also played football, but you, uh, uh, in the, uh, what it was, the 130-pound middleweight squad, mm -hmm. but you had to uh, stop because of uh, when Harold contracted tuberculosis, the, uh, the health of the, the, the other brothers were look, was looked at. <laughs> well, as a matter of fact, just to put my sports achievements in uh, the proper context, I went out for everything. I went out in addition to football and basketball. I went out for track. I, I did make the water polo team. I learned to swim, fortunately, and that's something that has served me well through the years since then. Uh, but I was not that good at athletics. I wasn't big enough for football. Uh, but uh, in, when I went over to Whittier High School after two years at Fullerton, I was big enough at least, uh, I no longer could play for the 130-pound team. Uh, I weighed about 150, so I wanted to go out for the varsity, and I took a suit out and was ready to go out and was looking forward to it. And Dr. Coffin, who was the, our doctor for Harold at that time. An unfortunate uh, name. Uh, that's right. Dr. Coffin uh, examined uh, Donald and me. He found in Donald's case, uh, unfortunately, incipient tuberculosis. And Donald had to go to Arizona for one year with Harold uh, before he uh, recovered from that. Fortunately, he had no consequences. In my case, uh, to my consternation, not because I feared it, but he found that I had uh, a scar on the lung, and therefore he advised against continuing football. Well, I turned in the suit. I remember it was a very difficult thing to do. So that was the end of my football career, but I took it up again when I went to Whittier College, uh, when I went out for football for four years. Made a letter only in my first year when we had only 11 eligible men and they had to play me. 
at this uh, at this time in high school, you were active in debate. The scar, incidentally, was because I'd had pneumonia when I was three years of age and almost died, and that scar is still on my lung. But it's uh, no problem. Excuse me. The um, uh, a couple of the uh, the debate topics. It, it it interests me to see not so much in high school but in college. I know the subjects that you debated uh, and that you researched uh, formulated opinions, uh, st uh, formulated opinions that you've carried on through. Uh, I think in high school the subjects weren't as earth shaking. One had to do with insects and one had to do with uh, renting. Well, in fact, let me tell you that was in grade school, not even uh -huh. high school. In grammar school, the boys debated the girls. And I remember it to this day. It was a real competition. And I, I, it was always difficult thereafter. That's one of the problems I had with Helen Gahaga Douglas. I just, you just can't really be as effective in debate when you're debating a woman, let's face it. And so I'd had experience at an early point. The, the two debates I remember that we had, uh, one was it's better to rent than to buy. Uh, and I had the affirmative of that, the boys did, and I felt very badly about it because I, I thought that owning a home was the best thing on earth, and I talked to the old man about it, and he gave me very good advice. He, as I said, he was very competitive, and he wrote something out for me, and I used it in the debate. It was very effective. He said it's, uh, uh, he did, he laid off of the whole, of the issue that, of course, the other side would use, that you should own your home because what does it mean spiritually and all that sort of thing, and he just stayed right on the economics. He said, when you own your home, uh, you have to pay for repairs, you have to borrow money, uh, and then you have to pay the interest on it. Uh, if you lose a job, uh, then uh, you lose the home, uh, and uh, therefore uh, it is a very great risk. Much easier, he said, and better to rent. Then uh, the landlord has to make the repairs. Uh, if you lose your job, uh, you just move on and let, let the land, leave the landlord uh, holding the sack. Well, it uh, was perhaps uh, a little bit frivolous to attack it that way, but we won the debate on that particular issue. The other one was tough, too. Uh, it resolved that insects are more beneficial than harmful, and we had the positive of that or the affirmative. Well, my God, when you think of things like uh, mosquitoes and uh, uh, all the other terrible insects, flies, how could you possibly say that they were more beneficial than harmful? But I knew that my Uncle Tim, of course, was an expert on this. Uh, and so uh, I went over to see him. He was the entomologist. That's right. He was an entomologist. Uh, we, he, he was always out in the family reunions with uh, wearing his glasses and a hat and going around catching bugs or butterflies. He had the greatest butterfly collection in all of California, incidentally, a famous one. Anyway, I said, Uncle Tim, I says, what about this? He says, oh, you got the best side of it. And so he told me that Sure, there were some bad insects, but he said, on the other hand, in order for plants and trees to grow, there must be pollinization. There cannot be pollinization without insects. And plants and trees exude oxygen. Without oxygen, we would all suffocate, ergo. Uh, if you do not have insects, uh, you do not have plants and trees, you don't have oxygen, we'll all die. Well, I'm oversimplifying what a great entomologist told me but we won on that issue, too. So I learned very early, go to the experts. Do you think that the uh, changing times, that, uh, that it is possible today uh, for women in politics to, to, to for, a, for, a, for a male, for a man politician, to debate a woman uh, on purely, on, on the, the substance of the issue, has that, uh, it's difficult. Has that changed? It's, it's quite difficult, actually. Uh, oh, I, I know that uh, in these days, uh, Women insist on ERA. They they want not only the rights but the responsibilities of men. Uh, uh, they want to be drafted into the armed forces if men are drafted into the armed forces and carry a gun if men do, and so forth and so on. Uh, but that ethic, uh, which we grew up with, I did at least. Uh, I think it carries over a great deal more than we think. And after all, women are different. Oh sure, they compete equally now. Uh, when I went to law school, there were only three women in my graduating class out of uh, a graduating class of 30. Now a third of all the law graduates are women. Uh, television, for example, women are, have come into their own uh, and so forth. Uh, and in politics, they haven't yet reached uh, the numbers and the proportions that they do in the law, but they will eventually. The difficulty is that when a man does meet with a woman, he's at a disadvantage. Let me give you one example to prove it. 
in my meetings with Golda Meir. Uh, she would come in to see me, and I remember so well that uh, she, the first time we met, uh, we posed for the photographers and so forth, and she was all smiling and graceful and so forth. As soon as they left the room, she crossed her legs, lit a cigarette, and said, now how about those planes that you promised and that we haven't gotten? It was all business. The thing I liked about Golda was she's very tough, uh, and she was very feminine when you got to know her. Uh, but she acted like a man, and uh, she wanted to be treated like one. She didn't act like a man and want to be treated like a woman. Totally different was Mrs. Gandhi, also very able. I'd known her father, and she was her father's daughter. Uh, but when her Mrs. father was uh, Nehru. Nehru. But when Mrs. Gandhi came in, uh, she was very smooth and very silken, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, she was just as tough uh, as Golda Meir. Uh, but while she acted like a man, she wanted to be treated by, by a, like a woman. And it was very, put whoever was dealing with her at a disadvantage. So in other words, let me just say this. Uh, I, I think it's very important that women have every opportunity to go to the top in any field, and particularly in politics. But I would strongly urge that, uh, that those who really want to succeed should give no quarter and ask for no quarter because they happen to be women. Uh, I think men, however, are always going to treat them as women, and that's the way it should be. Do women make as good politicians as men? They can be very effective, very effective. Margaret Thatcher, for example, uh, Claire Booth Luce, uh, I'm speaking of some that I've known, uh, Mrs. Gandhi, uh, certainly Golda Meir. Uh, they can hold their own with any man that I know, no question about it. Why are there so few comparatively? Why is it, though, that you can number on a couple of hands the women who have risen to the top in politics? Because the revolution has occurred uh, so recently. Uh, I know, for example, that uh, Paul Johnson in the book The Offshore Islanders uh, makes the point that the revolution in terms of, of bringing women into politics uh, has not gone as, uh, as fast as it should. This was incidentally, that book was completed, his book, the great book, uh, before Margaret Thatcher was elected uh, as prime minister uh, or became prime minister after winning the election. Her party won the election. Uh, and, and he makes a point that I would also make. I've made it with regard to all minorities. I make it with regard to blacks. I make it with regard to uh, women, anybody else that isn't uh, represented properly. Everyone in this society is a great natural resource. Uh, every group is. And it's very important that every individual, whatever his background, sex, race, et cetera, have the opportunity to go to the top. Otherwise, a society is not as great as it can be if there's any one group. Uh, that is discriminated against. And so it is with women. Uh, uh, let me say that uh, you look at some of the women on television, uh, not just in acting, uh, but some of the women in politics, uh, some of the women in science and the rest. What a loss it would be if it were like it was back in some period in the Victorian age when women didn't have these opportunities. And let me say, incidentally, you could go back a little further than that uh, anybody who wants to read a little about history back in the age of the 18th century and so forth uh, and the early 19th century, there was a period when women played a very, very important role with their salons and so forth and so on. So as I see it, women now are coming into their own and if they play it right and if the rest of the country has the good sense to give them the opportunity, we're going to be a stronger, more effective uh, democratic uh, country than we would be otherwise. Didn't uh, President Pompidou uh, joke with you about uh, Golda Meir, your dealings yes. with her? Yes, I had a very interesting conversation with him about that. Uh, <clears throat> he, uh, he used to describe her as an femme formid uh, formidable, a uh, very formidable woman. But she was, of course, more than that. But I recall that at a meeting that we had in the Azores, Bill Rogers, the Secretary of State, was trying to make, uh, you know, casual conversation during dinner after we'd had some pretty tough negotiations about uh, the dollar uh, in this relationship to the franc and all that sort of thing. And uh, Rogers made the point, <coughs> this was back in 1971, and he said, you know, Mr. President, he said, uh, it's interesting to note that throughout the world today, uh, 
things seem to be pretty uh, placid, except, of course, what's going on in Vietnam, except in two places uh, in Vietnam, and uh, sorry, except in two places. Uh, throughout the world today, things are going pretty well, except in two places, uh, one in the Mideast uh, and the other, of course, in uh, South Asia. And there it happens that women are in charge. Uh, and Pompidou uh, raised his eyes, and Rogers went on to say, for example, down in uh, South Asia, uh, you have the difficulties in India and Pakistan, and you have uh, Mrs. Gandhi as Prime Minister. And then in the Mideast, you have the problems of Israel and its Arab neighbors. And there you have Golda Meir, another woman as Prime Minister. Translation made. Pompidou raised his eye in a typical French way, cynical. Are you sure? <laughs> you, uh, uh, in uh, high school, you were uh, named the uh, manager of the student body. And uh, I think you've said at one point that uh, that experience proved to you that you would never want to become a salesman of any kind. Mm. Uh, Absolutely. As a matter of fact, the reason I made manager of the student body is that I lost my first election. Uh, I had been elected president of my class a night at when I finished grammar school, and I think I was president of another class along the way. But I, when I ran for student body president against my good friend Roy Newsom, who later became president of Whittier College, we lost to an independent candidate, Bob Logue, uh, who turned out to be a fine student body president. And so the faculty named me manager of the student body. One of the one of the functions of the manager is to go out to sell ads uh, for the college annual. I was not good at it at all. I, I was never able uh, to go up to somebody and ask them for a contribution or to sell an ad or something like that. I was a, so I got others to do it, and I was a pretty good manager, and we balanced our budget and so forth. And incidentally, that's carried through throughout my life. In all of my political campaigning, I've never gone door to door. I cannot do it. Uh, th there's a myth that's grown up about my first campaign and even the campaign for the Senate. They point out that I worked hard, which I did, and that Pat and I, that we used to go door to door and ask people to vote for us. Never. I could do it in small groups or even large groups, but going individually in and invading the privacy of a home and saying, well, you vote for me and here's a piece of literature. If they came to my, pl my place, I'd kick them out. <laughs> I would understand it if they did that to me. What is it that, that impels someone who, at this early stage, learned the lesson that he didn't want to be a salesman? Uh, isn't a politician a salesman? And what, uh, what is it true. then that, uh, that made you go into politics, which involved mm. dealing with people and can indeed sort of selling, or selling yourself or selling the things you believed in? What? It's very difficult to uh, psychoanalyze oneself. Uh, uh, the, uh, uh, certainly, in terms of the usual tests of a politician, being gregarious, etc., I would not meet that. Uh, although I do, I, I do quite well. Uh, I can walk up and down a street and pop into the uh, the various places of business when it it's when I don't feel I'm intruding, when they don't mind. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, it's really it's really not uh, possible to, for me to give a good answer to that. Uh, I think that in terms of my own political career, uh, it's, it hasn't been a case of my thinking of my selling myself, but it's been a case of my having certain ideas that I felt very strongly about and that I wanted to advocate and have, be in a position to implement, and I was driven by that, a and not by the idea, look, I'm a great salesman and the only people get a chance to shake my hand and look in my eye, they're going to vote for me. I never thought that. At one point, much later on in 68, you told a, uh, a writer uh, in analyzing yourself that you were an introvert in an extrovert's game. I think that's quite true. Uh, I mean, that is the, that, that is the uh, certainly, l let, me, let me put it this way. Everybody believes that politics is an extrovert's game. Uh, but on the other hand, many times the extroverts don't win uh, necessarily. In other words, particularly in this day of television, I think uh, that maybe some people who are not gregarious in the rest may be able to come over quite well in the tube. I'm not sure. Uh, I would hope that that's the case because let me say, I know two others that were introverts in the extro extroverts game. Bob Taft was one. Tom Dewey was one. 
Uh, they were both essentially shy men who found it very difficult, Taft even more than Dewey, uh, very difficult to, to go out and frankly ask people to vote for them. Uh, they could do it in a big crowd, but they couldn't do it individually as well. And now they were both p great uh, political leaders, uh, one as a governor and the other as a senator. And either one would have made a great president under certain circumstances. Weren't uh, also uh, even Kennedy and uh, John Kennedy and Eisenhower were, were right. private uh, Very much people. so. Uh, I, think that, I think that John Kennedy, despite all of the talk, uh, which I understand about his charisma and the rest, uh, that John Kennedy was a very private person. When I first met him as a congressman, uh, he's essentially quite shy, quite withdrawn. He's a studious, intellectual, et cetera. Very different. I'll tell you the one in the family who is not shy, who's just the opposite of him. And you wouldn't think they were brothers except they have the same name and do resemble each other, and that's Teddy. Now, Teddy is a typical Irish extrovert politician. But Jack was more withdrawn and more private uh, insofar as his uh, uh, whole attitude is certain. Eisenhower the same. Uh, Eisenhower had a, had a curious uh, feeling about people uh, being too familiar with him. Uh, he didn't want uh, people to grab him. Uh, perhaps it was the dignity of the office or something, but Eisenhower could get very, very cool if somebody, for example, told an off-color story uh, or became familiar, told a joke or something that he didn't think was proper. Uh, with his intimates, uh, he could be very friendly and outgoing, uh, but when it was strangers, uh, he didn't want people to, be, to take any uh, familiarities with him. The same is true of Kennedy. Johnson, no. Johnson was, the, was, was a total extrovert. He just loved it. You, uh, you mentioned once about Eisenhower in these, uh, along these lines that when you first uh, went to see him in 52 after you'd been uh, nominated to meet him at the uh, Blackstone yeah. Hotel, I guess, you came in and you, had, uh, you didn't know what to call him, that you had called uh, Hoover chief. Yes. Yes, I remember that very well. And I remember that I when I went in to see him, and he, uh, I said, well, uh, uh, let me see. When I, when I went in to see him, uh, he shook my hand and, and, uh, uh, and said I, he would like for me to accept the nomination as vice president. And I said, I would be very happy to, to do so, very honored uh, to do so, chief. And I could sense immediately a little coolness developing. Uh, he didn't like that. Uh, from then on, it was general. And I learned, incidentally, uh, that while, of course, when he was president, we called him Mr. President, he always really preferred to be called general. That was his favorite. And after he left the presidency, we never called him Mr. President. It was always general. But he didn't like the familiar. The chief, that belonged to Herbert Hoover. It was not something Eisenhower liked. We, uh, we've been talking about uh, your uh, years in high school, and I think it was during that time that uh, Harold's uh, that Harold became ill, and it was diagnosed as tuberculosis, which started a long. Uh, well, as a matter of fact, Harold's tuberculosis started before that. Uh, it started when we were in Yorba Linda, and incidentally, it may have come for a reason, uh, in retrospect, uh, that had to do with my father's uh, attitude toward raw milk. My father had a thing about raw milk. Uh, he thought pasteurized milk, he says, what they do, do, they take milk, they heat it up, it's all dirty and filthy, and then they sell it to you because it's been heated. And so he always insisted on a raw milk. It was supposed to be better. So he always had a cow and we had raw milk. I think it's possible the cow could have been tubercular. In any event, my brother, Harold, contracted tuberculosis uh, when he was in the seventh grade in Yorba Linda. When we moved over to Whittier, and East Whittier, he went to that school there, he had to drop out a year. And he was behind in his class. And from then on, uh, it was very difficult uh, for him to adjust to high school. He was very bright. He had excellent marks before uh, he had to drop out uh, and got behind uh, the others uh, in his class. Uh, and so uh, then, when he was a junior in high school, I remember, he began running my folks thought, with a sort of a fast crowd. He was a very handsome fellow, and, uh, and the girls just swooned over him. 
he had so many girlfriends, believe me, uh, it was something to see. Wasn't he was the, the only blonde in the family? Uh, he was the blonde. The, family? Yeah. the, the first born in uh, all of our, it's uh, interesting, uh, there were six sisters. All of them had children. All the first born. All of them, incidentally, except for Olive, were brown haired and brown eyed. But Olive pointed out to me that every first born, and that was true of Hannah, it was true of Martha, it was true of Edith, it was true of also of Jane and Elizabeth. The firstborn had blue eyes and the others had brown eyes. I don't know what that means. But anyway, Harold had blue eyes, as did uh, and my father had blue eyes too. My mother's were brown eyes. Uh, but in any event, in his junior year, uh, they decided that uh, he was running with a fast crowd, a little smoking, and that sort of thing. And so they had him go east to school to Mount Hermon School for Boys. Uh, which a real estate agent, Harold Gardner, had recommended strongly. Well, it was a fine school. He went back there and he got along, I guess, reasonably well, but within a half year he was home because uh, uh, he had lost a lot of weight. And I remember we went over to the Pasadena Railroad Station and I remember his coming off the train. He was painfully thin and he'd grown a mustache. He cut a fine figure, but I, th I knew something was wrong. And then he contracted tuberculosis again, had another hemorrhage. And then for five years, it just got worse and worse and worse. Everything was tried, pneumothorax, uh, rest, uh, bed rest, etc. cetera. Uh, but he just withered away. And then uh, that was something that uh, we had to live with for a while and that he had to live with, which was worse. Didn't your uh, uh, mother and father start a series of taking him to different places to, your father built a cabin in the Antelope Valley because the weather there was supposed <coughs> to be drier and better? Yes. The Antelope Valley, we had a cabin there. Uh, the most expensive place we went was to the Hillcrest Sanitarium, uh, which was over in the Beverly Hills area. It was very, very expensive. And my father, uh, we had an acre where the service station would store, which he paid $5,000 for. Uh, when he had built it, uh, he built the service station the store on that acre. And I remember he uh, cut it in half and sold the lower half of it to Harry Schuyler, a neighbor, uh, for $800 in order to defray some of the expenses for the care at Hillcrest Sanitarium. Uh, where incidentally, one of the things my brother did, he, uh, uh, one of the nurses uh, fell for him and uh, they, uh, almost came to the point of getting married, whatever that means. Anyway, finally it was Arizona, uh, Prescott, Arizona, mile high. Uh, and so my mother took Harold over there and she was there for almost three years with him. And didn't she had other patients as well? Well, this story is one that uh, I'm afraid most people will find hard to believe in this day and age. Yes. Uh, in order to keep him there, uh, that meant that uh, it was be very costly because the, the medical bills were pretty big too. And so she took three other patients. There was Larry and Leslie and a man we called the Major. He was a Canadian Major who had been gassed at uh, Flanders in World War I. Uh, uh, they were all bed patients except the, the Major now and then could be ambulatory. And for that period of time, my mother, alone, with no help, whatever, she gave them alcohol rubs, uh, she took them trays, uh, she uh, took care of, of course, the laundry and all that sort of thing. Uh, and uh, it was really a remarkable achievement. And of course, in addition to taking care of Harold, uh, who was one of the sickest of the lot. And so, under those circumstances, uh, it. Uh, it, 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 was, it was remarkable that she was able to do it. But there was another one, I should say, there was one other uh, that uh, now that you remind me, and he, was not, he didn't live with her, but there was a fellow who was the most interesting one of all. I thought he was the most interesting. Uh, he was a, a gambler, actually, I learned, uh, from New York. He contracted tuberculosis, and he had a driver, a chauffeur, no less, and he found about uh, when my mother was there that she was a great cook. And so he came in and took his meals there and left very handsome tips when he did. And he used to regale us with stories about uh, New York City. And from that time, I wanted to go to New York. It was, it was a cold and relentless and forbidding pace, but it had an enormous uh, pull to go there. And it took years before I got there, but uh, anyway. 
This fellow was, uh, had a couple of interesting experiences with him. Uh, Marshall Clough, whose uh, father had tuberculosis, he had, been the Mi he had been the Miami Ford dealer, as a matter of fact. No, Miami Chevrolet dealer. Uh, and then had come to Arizona. But Marshall Clough, his son, and I were great friends. And we used to ramble around in the hills back there in Prescott. And one time we came, up, we came upon uh, what was apparently uh, a whole cache that had been left by a bootlegger. Because you understand, this was before prohibition uh, had been repealed. And so we uh, found these 12 bottles, and we didn't know what to do with them. And we weren't sure what it was, so we took it to our friend from New York, who was there for lunch. And we said, uh, we don't know what this is. And uh, he says, could you tell us? And he says, oh, yes. He says, let me ask George. George is a chauffeur. He'll drink anything. He'll even drink ink. That's the last we saw of the 12 bottles. Well, the sad part of the story is that uh, that was 1928. And uh, that was the year that Al Smith ran for the presidency. And uh, this gambler bet everything on Al Smith. And he wrote to us in California, to me in California later, uh, right after Smith lost. And he said, well, Smith lost. I lost the car, and I also lost George. <laughs> Didn't uh, you would go and visit on, uh, during the summers and at, uh, on certain weekends. Must have been a very long and yes. tortuous drive. Well, as a matter of fact, we didn't go on weekends. You know, it was a 14-hour drive. That was before mm. the superhighways were in. And it was, uh, except for a very, very short stretch until you got down to Indio, it was all dirt road. Uh, and we drove, we drove over, I'd spend the summers there, uh, and we drove over at Christmas time and sometimes Easter vacation. and. Uh, I remember it was uh, quite expensive, we thought, because at that time we had to keep up to both places, and my father did all the cooking, incidentally. Uh, I remember that every Sunday uh, he used to make a marvelous pot roast. Uh, he'd take a pot roast and he'd put onions and carrots and potatoes around it, and that was our big Sunday meal. And a uh, pretty good cook. But anyway, uh, in order to save money, you see, we had a service station at that time. He got a gray, big 25-gallon uh, or, I guess, 30-gallon uh, uh, can and put gasoline in it and carried the gasoline with him across because in Arizona the gasoline was about 7 or 8 cents higher than it was in California. And California at that time was 15 cents a gallon. In Arizona it was 28 cents a gallon. <laughs> you imagine that. I remember the irritation, though. He had to stop at a service station on an occasion to get air in his tire. And the guy that owned the station was so furious at him. So uh, he proceeded to buy a couple of candy bars or something just to put him right. Um, in Prescott, when you would go there for the summers, you worked. You, oh, you yes. plucked chickens at one point, and you yes, cleaned I a plucked, swimming pool. And I plucked chickens. And uh, uh, one thing that I couldn't do that I found very difficult, I, I couldn't kill them. Uh, so uh, I. Uh, uh, the way it did, just th this fellow that we did it for, the market, he would wring their necks. And I couldn't do that. And the other one, uh, another way that, that uh, uh, we could kill them was to use a cleaver. And I'll never forget when I had the res that assignment to do it. You know, here's, such a, here's this chicken, I got to hit it with the cleaver. I close my eyes and I brought the cleaver down and I open them and I hit the chicken right in the head instead of in the neck and I had to do it again. I just, from that time on, I said, no more chicken plucking unless somebody else kills them. Oh, I also uh, cleaned swimming pools. And, but the most fun, they had what we call the Frontier Day celebration in Prescott. They still have it. It's a rodeo. And then they had the, they called a Slippery Gulch. Slippery Gulch, they had gambling. Uh, wasn't legal, I guess, but uh, some way in Arizona was sort of a wide open place. And I ran, I was a barker. Uh, for a Wheel of Fortune where we gave away hams and bacons and other prizes. Uh, and uh, I, uh, I could yell it out, come on, do this or that. And people would buy chits at 10 cents each, and then they could win a ham or bacon. So and I remember my grandmother, who she was in her 80s that time, coming over on one occasion. And she, of course, didn't believe in gambling. And so I said, look, grandmother, you've got to do it just one time. And believe it or not, she won a ham. Boy, did we enjoy that ham. 
even though it was perhaps gotten in ways that she wouldn't appreciate. Didn't you say that at one point your mother, who also disapproved of gambling in Whittier, was tempted by the food at a movie raffle and sent you off to see the same movie a couple of times? To Actually, the way it was is that the, uh, at the movie there was a raffle where, uh, where you won a money prize. And uh, the money prize was very significant, and it would keep piling up. It was started at $100 and then three or $400. Well, it was down in La Habra, and uh, my mother went to see the movie. We didn't go to many. It was a clean one. Uh, and uh, then uh, the, uh, and then we, would, we went about a half, half a dozen times, but we never won. But, we, but I remember we saw the same movie two or three times. Incidentally, the first movie I remember seeing was Inside the Cup, whatever that was. But the one I remember most vividly, of course, was the Ten Commandments. Mm -hmm. I'll never forget going to the Carthay Circle Theater and seeing that, and I'll never forget, I can remember it to this day, uh, uh, the, uh, the impact on, uh, uh, on the audience uh, of, uh, of a movie. Another one that I saw which made a very great impression on me was uh, All Quiet in the Western Front. And, and on that one, that was at the Carthay Circle Theater in Los Angeles. On that one, I remember uh, when uh, one of the scenes, very moving, you know, with Lou Ayers and the rest and, and uh, lots of uh, killing and so forth, that uh, women, a couple of women, got up with crying and left the theater. And I thought they were probably those that had lost sons in World War I. The, uh, your, as you say, your, your mother was gone in, uh, with Harold and Prescott for uh, three years or more. Three years. Um, uh, some commentators or observers have written that you must have, some uh, psychologists have written, that you must have felt bitter or resentful or very disappointed that, uh, that she left you for such a long time <laughs> uh, at such a crucial time in your development. It's Did you? It's nonsense. You know, these, uh, these psycho historians are psychos. That's all I can say about them. Well, that's so ridiculous. We, they don't know. I guess it's because perhaps they must have had unhappy childhoods uh, because basically uh, our family was so close. We were rooting for Harold uh, and we would have done anything, any of us, for him as he would for us if he'd been able. And uh, I just, we all thought, uh, Don and I and the old man, we thought uh, my mother was doing the right thing. And uh, we were just sorry it didn't work out. Do you think your personality or your uh, temperament is different because the, your mother was gone for three of these formative years and you were in, a, uh, in, a, in an all-male household? Does that make any difference in the long run? No, you have to remember, too, though, that in this period of time, although my mother was there, my grandmother was still uh, living up just a few blocks away from us, or a few miles, a couple of miles, I should say. My Aunt Ollie was there. Uh, we saw Aunt Edith on occasion. The family was always rallying around. No, we didn't, uh, we didn't lack for feminine company, if that's what people are raising. And uh, in, in fact, too, my mother was an extraordinarily good letter writer. Uh, she must have written us at least once a week. And uh, they were beautiful letters. And uh, we, in turn, wrote to her. And uh, Harold, of course, uh, would write. You know, a curious thing, speaking of letter writing. Uh, he had a, like my grandmother, he had a gift for poetry. He wrote to my mother in poetry a great number of times. And uh, she kept those letters, most of them, I guess, or virtually all of them. And I remember that uh, she uh, always felt that they were very important. Didn't she carry them uh, after he died? Didn't she carry them with yes. her? Yes. Well, I, uh, yes, now that you mention it, she did. Uh, she had them in her purse. And uh, what happened was, it's really tragic, uh, at the time that Tricia was born at Murphy Memorial Hospital, uh, my mother was up there to see Pat and, of course, to see the baby. And she'd parked her car in the parking lot. And even there in Whittier, there are thieves. And a thief broke in, and, and she left her purse in the car, took the purse, the letters from Harold, the last one she had received, 
uh, about a half a dozen in his handwriting, were in the purse. She never got the purse back. That was no great loss. Mm. Wasn't much in it. But the letters were, of course, uh, priceless. And she carried them for 16 years. And she'd had them for 16 years because he had died in 1933. Mm. And this was 1946. Mm. That's right. Mm. Did you consider going, uh, when it came time to go to college, did you uh, consider going east to college? Yes. <clears throat> in fact, uh, I received an award from the Harvard Club of California, uh, which will probably irritate many of my friends who did go to Harvard, but I received it as the outstanding male graduate of the class of 1930. Uh, and uh, the award, incidentally, was quite interesting. It wasn't a scholarship. It gave you the opportunity to apply for one. But they gave me a biography of Dean Briggs. Uh, dean Briggs was the dean of Harvard, and he was the one that founded, was the first dean of Radcliffe. Uh, and I read that biography from cover to cover, incidentally. But I didn't end up at Harvard. And then also our old friend, the insurance man, uh, had, uh, that I referred to earlier, uh, had uh, uh, gone to Yale, and uh, he wanted me to apply for the Yale scholarship that was available in Southern California. But the difficulty with doing either that I knew we might get a scholarship, but I knew I couldn't afford to go. So I decided to go to Whittier and to stay at home, and they needed me. They needed me in the store. Uh, uh, this was before Harold had died and so forth. There was no way uh, that, uh, uh, no, I'm sorry. Uh, and they, they, they needed me at that point, so I decided to uh, stay there. Now, that was before, strike, let me go back. Uh, after all, Harold, of course, was still sick. This was, uh, this was the time when the medical expenses were enormous, 1930, 31, 32, 33. Uh, and so uh, I decided to stay home, and I had no regrets. <clears throat> How would you be a different man today if you had gone to Harvard? Oh. Uh, I would probably have ended up in a New York law firm early on. Uh, I, I think I would have been competitive at Harvard. I was competitive at Duke. Of course, it wasn't as, as uh, big a school as Harvard, uh, but it was highly selective. There were 25 Phi Beta Kappas in my first year class at Duke. Uh, all had scholarships, as I did. Uh, and I think probably had I gone there, I, I, I would have... Uh, I guess what we're talking about, though, is if you're talking about the Harvard undergraduate school, yes. uh, I would have adjusted to it pretty well. I think what I would have gotten by reasonably well, uh, but uh, may have, would probably have stayed in the East, uh, would certainly not have gone into politics. So I think all the Harvard people probably would, uh, many of my friends from Harvard, because I have some who are supporters, but those who are not supporters say they wish I'd gone to Harvard, because then they wouldn't have had me in politics. You, uh, one of the reasons, as you say, that you had to stay at home was to work in the store. And uh, I know you had taken over the vegetable department at that point. What did that involve in terms of your school day and your work day? But it just added to it. Uh, I got up at about 3.30 or 4 o'clock in the morning, and uh, we had a truck, uh, not a very big one, a panel truck, and I would go over to the market, uh, uh, the vegetable market in Los Angeles. Uh, we'd pick up the fresh things there. In season, there would be apples and grapes and corn and uh, cucumbers and what have you, and uh, you'd have to bargain with the people. I liked those people, too. I remember, incidentally, those mornings were so cold. And often they'd have a great big tin, uh, you know, an open, a, a barrel, uh, and they'd, they'd have uh, fires burning in it. You see them, you know, the, from the wooden night. We'd all stand around there and talk about everything from uh, uh, the price of fruit to what was going on in the other parts of the world. And then you'd come back and uh, prepare I'd come the back. Oh, yes, I'd come back and then display the stuff. Uh, and. Uh, I always appreciated since then. Every time I go into a super supermarket these days, I look at those fantastic displays, and I have great admiration for those that did it. Later on, incidentally, 
I should point out that those who did take over the market after I left were, it was a Korean family, the Pax, and they did a fantastic job. I, I, our, uh, I was very fortunate, really, in Yorba Linda and also in East Whittier. Uh, all of us were fortunate in the family uh, to have known and gone to school with such a wide variety of people. I remember from Yorba Linda, I can remember very vividly a girl in our class. She was Japanese. Her name was uh, Tomika Dabasha, and she was so smart. Uh, her parents uh, ran a truck farm. Uh, I remember, too, a Mexican family, the Lauros, and there was Tony, a very handsome boy, and then two uh, twins, Jesus and Alexandro, and we used to play uh, a great deal together. Uh, I remember the Japanese, of course, uh, as I've mentioned, and also I particularly recall uh, the Koreans. Uh, and then, of course, at Whittier College, uh, Whittier being the kind of uh, institution it was, uh, we had two of my closest friends were Nate George, a great sprinter, and Bill Brock, a great fullback on our, full, our football team, who both of whom were blacks. So I, I, I think the very fact that we grew up in that kind of a community where there was just no feeling of race, as a matter of fact, you appreciated the diversity, was a very good background for all of us. Did you, uh, you had a brief stint uh, working at the butcher counter, I believe. I wasn't good at that. Uh, I've already indicated that uh, I wasn't very good, for example, when it came to uh, killing chickens. I just couldn't do it. And frankly, I wasn't good. Uh, you have to use a meat cleaver on pork chops. And uh, that's just not my bag. Now, my brother Don was very good at it, and he eventually became not only the butcher, but took over the market after my father retired. You told me once that you uh, stopped working in the butcher department after you'd cut your finger and bled into the hamburger. That certainly happened. Uh, and I made some very good hamburger. We uh, this was before, of course, there were machines. There were machines for everything now. A and you ground the hamburger this way, by hand. And uh, my, f my old man was very proud of our hamburger. We didn't put any suet in it. It was all just the best trimmings from the meat and so forth. And people would come from miles around to get our hamburger because we sold it also at a very good price, 15 cents a pound. What were the four Bs? Well, the four Bs, that had to do with... Uh, a little society, which I suppose some would call a fraternity. Whittier College did not have fraternities. They didn't believe in elitism at all. But they did have societies, because people do get together. And when I went to Whittier in my freshman year, uh, the men's society on campus was called the Franklin Society. And those were sort of the, frankly, the better off students, uh, the ones that had a little more than the rest, and so forth and so on. And an indication of how well off they were is that for the student yearbook, they had their pictures taken in tuxedos. Dean Triggs, who was a sophomore when I was a freshman, had spent his first year at Colorado College. He had been a member of a fraternity there, Beta Theta Phi, a very good one. And when he came in and he saw the Franklins there, and, and Dean was a, on the football team, as I was, and so forth, he said, let's start another society. So he did. and and. Those who joined the society, all the charter members, were, were football players uh, or in athletics in one way or another. And uh, I wrote the Constitution for it, and I wrote the, I wrote the song for it. Uh, Dean, however, gave us the ideas about its initiation, which was a horrible thing, I thought. Uh, he also gave us the uh, slogan of the society, a croiso à l'enfant, which, as you recall, Voltaire used to say that, Voltaire. Uh, stamp out evil, whatever that uh, could mean at that period in our lives. And then uh, the three, the four Bs it was, stood for beans, brains, brawn, and bowels. Now the bowels, of course, guts for the football player. The brains, we were all students. Uh, the brawn, we were going to be strong. The beans was that in those depression years, uh, every week we used to get together for a feed. Uh, we didn't have meat, uh, so we had beans. Now and then we'd throw a little hamburger in it. So we had bean feeds every week. I mean, did we eat beans? What was, you said the initiation was gruesome. What was it? Well, the, the, the symbol of the society, or at least the mascot, was supposed to be a boar. And so we would take the new members into the hills and uh, have them dig up a dead boar or 
uh, and then eat the boar meat. Well, of course, we, it was a, not a boar, it was a dog that we used, and obviously we wouldn't have them eat dog meat, but we'd get beef and we put it in asafidity, and then they'd have to eat that beef in asafidity, which is horrible, horrible smelling and so forth, and they'd have to eat that to prove their manhood. So uh, uh, I, by being a charter member, avoided that, because believe me, uh, initiations are no fun. I did go through one initiation, though, and in, in my, my junior year, uh, I joined the glee club. I don't know why. Uh, I, was a, I was a fair base. Uh, but uh, I wasn't that good, so there may be master ceremonies, but it wasn't too bad. I had a lot of fun there. Got to go on the Glee Club trips, which is great fun. Uh, but I remember that, uh, that uh, when I was initiated in the Glee Club, uh, they had uh, another, I thought, rather crude kind of uh, a custom, and that was uh, you'd have to first uh, take off all your clothes, and they had a huge cake of ice there. And you'd sit on the ice for a while, and then they'd take a big paddle, you'd get up and slap you over the rump, and then they'd say, sit on the ice to cool off, and then you'd get up and they'd slap you over the rump to warm up. Well, by the time we'd gone through that a while, you were pretty tired. And I got so tired, I got pneumonia. And I was out, knocked out for at least a week. My, f my mother was out of her mind. My father thought he ought, we ought to sue them and so forth. I said, forget it, say nothing. So I went back, and we had a great time thereafter. But I was glad I didn't have to be initiated into the Orthogonians. That's the advantage of being a charter member of anything. You've said that uh, at one point that the, the thing you didn't like about the fraternity was the, uh, the uh, oh, yeah. knock sessions. You see, uh, not having been a member of any other fraternity, I don't know how it was at Beta Theta Phi, but in Dean Trigg said that the system would be that we'd all sit around in a group in a square, we called it, and uh, then uh, ortho we would have the Orthogonian meant square, and we'd all sit around, and we'd have a knock and boost session, and you'd go right around the table, and uh, there'd be about 25 of us, and each fellow would get up and say, I have a boost for this guy for it, and I have a knock for him because I didn't like what he did in, uh, in uh, the classroom the other day, or he's uh, been uh, making eyes at my girl, or what have you. Uh, I thought it was... Uh, it just really turned me off. I couldn't do it. I've never knocked anybody, incidentally, at that one. I could give them a boost. But what I didn't like was uh, uh, the, the, uh, the fact that it was such an invasion of privacy. Uh, I, I, know that, I know these days that, that is the proper therapy for alcoholism, uh, for psychiatric problems, et cetera, et cetera, to have this uh, laying on a couch or discussing all these things and so forth and so on. No way for me, I could never do it. Which of the uh, professors <coughs> do you remember? I know that, that Whittier, because it was a Quaker school, had a, a very tolerant uh, and, and very sophisticated uh, faculty at that time, more so than a lot of other small, uh, similarly small schools. Which are the which professors, if any, stand out in your mind well, as having influenced you? It was really an exceptional group of professors. Uh, all the ones that uh, I recall had doctorates. Uh, there were doctorates from the University of Wisconsin, from Harvard, from Columbia, uh, from uh, the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, quite remarkable. Another thing that was remarkable about them that I should mention, and that faculty in those Depression years they were paid about $300 a month, $3,600. That was a full professor's salary. And because times were so difficult, and we didn't know much about the Depression in those days, but I learned this years later, that whole faculty voluntarily took a 10% cut on their salaries in order to keep the college going, and they never told us about it. Well, anyway, Paul Smith, my professor of history, remarkable man, University of Wisconsin. What he particularly, I think, inspired in all of us was a passion for books. I remember he used to get a book, a fine book, a, a Sir Esme Wingfield Stratford's History of British Civilization he assigned to the course. He'd open it up and read a passage on architecture and something, and his mouth would water. We used to say, don't sit in the front of Paul Smith's glasses because maybe it'll get on you, you know. His mouth would water. He says, isn't that wonderful? Isn't that wonderful? It made you want to read the book. Another one was Albert Upton. Albert Upton was, I said, 
could have been an agnostic, I'm not sure, but he always believed in broadening the education. And he was the one who, when he, one summer, said to me, look, you've got to broaden your education. You ought to read Tolstoy. And that summer, I read everything that Tolstoy has written, virtually everything, War and Peace and Anna Karenina and Possession and some of the phys philosophical treaties, uh, treatises. Uh, I became, frankly, a Tolstoyan, which is uh, very easy to do because uh, nobody can read Tolstoy without being deeply moved. What is a Tolstoyan? A Tolstoyan, uh, in my case, meant that, uh, a, uh, a belief in the individual and its importance, a belief in freedom, but particularly a passion for peace, peace and goodwill uh, for all people. That's what I saw as a Tolstoyan at that point. Didn't uh, Upton at a later point have some fun with some reporters that came to interview him, uh, yeah. deferring to a picture, a portrait of yours? Yes, he was a great uh, wag that way. He used to, he told me about it. He said that they came, there was a picture, uh, they had a portrait of me hanging in the, in the uh, office of the president. And he uh, went in and he told the reporters, every time we go in, we bow at the picture. The, uh, Excuse me, gentlemen. Uh, we're going to keep rolling the tape. I just want to raise one on the set for a second. Just a second. Going to go to the debate subjects. Uh, and then the trips, the speakeasy, and the pancake diet. Oh, what about the, uh, what about the religious thing? Don't you want to get that coming in? Coming to that. Oh, you're going to, that's coming be, later. We'll do sports, Harold, and the what can I believe. Mm -hmm. All right. Hello. Jim. Yep. Okay. The one that's up, Harold. Yeah. No. No. Not quite. Yep. Right. Was uh was this a ninety? Mm. Okay, thank you. Pleasant studio. Hmm. Yes, it's nice. Spacious. The set work out well as well. Yeah, I don't watch sets much, but it looks nice. Chief Newman. Yes. Want to say a word about him? Do you want to? I'll just just start it. Work in. The, do you remember any of the uh, debate topics that uh, that well, you I debated during those years? Them. I can remember all of them uh, because uh, they were great challenges at the time. Uh, one year it was uh, free trade versus protectionism. Uh, another year it was uh, the inter-allied war debts, whether they should be canceled or not. And uh, another year, I don't remember the exact title, but it was to the effect that resolved that the United States should have centralized control of the economy. Uh, in those debates, uh, we always had to argue both sides. We had to be prepared to argue both sides. But in the process of my studying for it and the research, I became a committed free trader. I've remained so ever since. Uh, I became certainly an internationalist. I, I was thoroughly convinced that the inter-allied board debts should be canceled, 
not simply because the Allies had taken, and I made this argument very strongly, because they had taken far greater losses than we had, but because I thought in terms of our own uh, economic progress, it was essential to get their economies back on a solid footing. And as a result of that, uh, when people see my support of foreign aid and international cooperation, a lot of it may go right back to that, although there are other arguments that can be made then. The other one, the, the, the centralized control, is the only time that I can remember that, uh, uh, that Hitler came into our consciousness. Because I remember I made the point that centralized control of an economy could lead to centralized control politically of a country. And then I shorthanded it to say, if you have dictatorship for an economy, it will lead to political dictatorship as well. Or put it in another way, economic dictatorship can lead to political dictatorship, and that's what's happened in Germany. And we don't want it to happen here. But I have been, of course, uh, throughout my political life, opposed to bigger and bigger government in Washington. Uh, and opposed to uh, <coughs> anything uh, that might pave the way for political dictatorship. You got to travel a lot with the debate we team. We had some great trips. Yes, we went up to uh, Oregon and Washington. I remember the time that we went to Washington, the Columbia River was frozen over. Uh, it was an exciting time. Uh, and then, of course, I recall a trip, the other trip that we took, uh, which took us uh, clear out to Brigham Young University in Utah. Uh, incidentally, we, had, we were very fortunate in those times. We stayed at the great hotels, uh, at the Hotel Utah and at uh, the other, uh, the great hotels also up in uh, Seattle, Washington. And they'd always give us a rate of a dollar a person. I'll never forget that. Uh, incidentally, which reminds me, the first time I ever stayed in a hotel, which, which does show the closeness of this whole Millhouse tribe or family, uh, after Arthur died, uh, all of us were terribly shaken. Uh, I was uh, emotionally very upset. And my Uncle Charlie, uh, he was my grandfather's youngest brother who lived up the road from us and whose estate I later handled as a lawyer. But my Uncle Charlie, uh, was a little better off than some. And I remember he had a great big seven passenger car. And he took my mother and father and uh, Don and me uh, in his big car down to San Diego and for a weekend just to get us away and give us a little lift. And we stayed at the U.S. Grant Hotel. And years later, uh, one of the most important speeches I made in my campaign for the Senate was made in that same old U.S. Grant Hotel. But be as it may, with debate, uh, uh, on these debate trips, the most vivid memory I have of the one in 1933 was that as we were traveling from Utah to our last uh, stop, which was to be at Arizona State at Tempe, we got snowed in at Cameron, Arizona, on the rim of the Grand Canyon, and for four days, we couldn't move. We didn't have any money, so we ate one meal a day, pancakes, which we got for 50 cents. And so we ate that at about 10 in the morning, and that was it. And then finally, uh, when the, the weather broke, we went down. Uh, we had to go to make the date, and we were to get there on time. And we found and we, that uh, we were told, and we had been prepared for this, that they wanted the debate very formal. They had it in black tie. And so I recall that we had to change into our black tie in the car on the way down there, and we got there just in time to go on stage. And they had a, a big crowd, over a thousand people for the debate, and uh, we won, two to one. <laughs> Didn't the uh, debate trips give you your first taste of the speakeasy life? Well, <clears throat> I'd never been in a speakeasy before or since, as a matter of fact, that I recall. But Joe Sweeney, uh, a very extrovert Irish uh, uh, iconoclast. Uh, when we got to San Francisco, uh, we were staying at the Whitcomb Hotel, and uh, he, uh, uh, we, he said, uh, uh, "Let's see if we can go out tonight." Now, understand this is in uh, the uh, in the time before prohibition was repealed, 
And uh, I remember we went into a drugstore, and uh, Sweeney showed him a card that Sweeney had gotten from the bellhop. San Francisco was a wide open town, as we learned later. And uh, this fellow pushed a button, and here was this, this whole wall with all medicines and things on swung open, and we were back in a dimly lighted room and uh, with a bar and uh, very attractive, sort of sultry cocktail waitresses there. I didn't know what in the world to order. I'd never had a hard drink before. And Sweeney said, get a Tom Collins. Well, uh, I had a Tom Collins. And uh, I must say, I was more impressed, however, by uh, just the atmosphere of the place and, and uh, these attractive cocktail waitresses going around than I was by the booze. <laughs> You've um, said that next to your father, the man who had the greatest influence on your life was uh, Chief Newman, your football coach. What, what was that influence? Well, when I say the chief, I, I shouldn't leave out others. Paul Smith had a great influence, of course, and my professors in law school did too. Uh, uh, Herbert Harris, who, with whom we studied Shakespeare, was a great teacher, and Dean Coffin and others. But the chief influenced me, not intellectually, uh, but in terms of character. Uh, the chief was an American Indian. Uh, he would have been certainly a, a consensus All-American if he had played at a different time, but he did play in the Rose Bowl when SC, Southern Cal, beat Penn State 14 to three back in 1923. Uh, he was proud, uh, full-blooded Indian, uh, never making any apologies for, never asking any quarter for the fact that he was. And, uh, and the chief was always uh, trying to inspire us, uh, inspire us to be uh, self-sufficient, to be competitive, uh, and above everything else, never to give up. Uh, you know, in those days, uh, they used to say it was getting rather current, and it, like it is today in some of the so-called better schools, uh, it isn't uh, uh, whether you win or lose, but how you play the game that counts. And the chief said, that's all fatuous nonsense. He says, of course how you play the game counts, uh, and you must always play fair. But it also, it also counts as to whether you win or lose. You play to win, and if you don't win, you kick yourself in the butt and be sure you don't make the same mistakes again. He drilled that into us. And uh, I must say, I was affected, and, I'm, and I would say hundreds of others who came under the chief, just by the character of the man, the strength of the man. Uh, I was never any good at it, but I learned a lot sitting by him on the bench. Here's a photograph of you at that time. Does that look like a real terror? Well, it doesn't look like a very imposing figure, and I wasn't, that's for sure. The man down in the corner sitting there, however, was an all-conference tackle. Uh, that was Gibbs, 205 pounds. He was a real good man. Weren't you so, sort of uh, either, didn't, didn't your career alternate between bench warming and cannon fodder? We did both. Uh, the bench warming, as a matter of fact, I did serve a useful purpose. The chief said I did, and of course he was a thoughtful man. Uh, after my junior year, I had not made the team, and I knew that there was no way I was going to make it my senior year, and I had a lot of things coming up, and I went to see the chief, and I said, Chief, I don't think I'll come out this year. And he says, Dick, you got to come out. He said, you know, we need you for the <laughs> play the other team's <laughs> <It's their> plays. <laughs> so, and also, he said, we just need more in the squad. And then the other thing he said, he says, also, I need you on the bench. I was kind of a cheerleader, you know. I was always, uh, and the uh, chief was a great believer uh, in, in that. The other thing is that uh, he is a, uh, I had read that uh, some of the, the other players used to vie to sit next to you at the steak dinners before each game that the team had. Uh, was that because you were so popular? Well, I think probably I didn't eat the steak. Was that it? <laughs> That's how they remember it. That's you right. were always so psyched up for the That's games, right. even That's though right. you were going to be on the bench, yeah. that you, would, you wouldn't be able to eat your food, and so whoever sat next to you would get two steaks. Yes, I remember, incidentally, uh, a, uh, a little... I do remember something about a steak dinner. Uh, I mentioned Bill Brock, who was our great fullback. Uh, we went on to play Arizona 
I did not uh, make the traveling squad even for that trip, but I drove separately to Arizona. And uh, uh, to show you how things have changed, Arizona at that time had a segregation. And uh, the chief took me aside quietly uh, before the team dinner, which was at a hotel. He said, Dick, uh, I'm going to give you five bucks. Take Bill out to dinner, he says, because uh, but tell him it, uh, don't let him think there's any discrimination. And so I took him to the best Mexican restaurant we could find, and we had a good dinner because they wouldn't let our black fellow eat with the rest of the players. How did he years feel later, about that? Years later, I asked Bill about it, and Bill said, you know, you really pulled it off. I didn't know that that's what had happened. I thought that's what you really wanted to do. So, but that shows you chief sensitivity because they wouldn't let chief in probably uh, down there. Maybe in Arizona they would let an Indian in, but they weren't letting blacks in at that point. And uh, you had something else on chief you were saying earlier. He was, uh, well, I guess we forgot. Um, it was at this time that uh, uh, when you were in college that your brother Harold died, that he got much sicker and, mm. and, then, uh, yes. and then died. Yeah, what happened was that uh, he came home from uh, Prescott, finally, and uh, it was all downhill from then on. Uh, he had pneumothorax. Pneumothorax is where you collapse the lung, one lung. Uh, but eventually what happened was they collapsed the one lung and the disease came to the other lung, and then it was all gone, and they had tried everything and so forth. And he had to know that the end was near. Uh, I remember the last... Uh, trip he took. Uh, he, he, he wanted to get out of the room, which was dank uh, there at home and so forth, and smelly with liniment and so forth, alcohol, uh, which they used for the rubs. And he said, uh, he got my old man to get a, to rent a Rio truck uh, with a, cha a Rio chassis it was, uh, and a superstructure was put on that made it kind of like a trailer. Uh, sort of an, uh, a house trader, so to speak. And uh, so they planned it very well, and, and uh, they, uh, they were planning to take this and spend uh, up two or three weeks on the road going through the mountains over to Arizona and so forth that he had remembered so well. And after three days, they were back. He couldn't, uh, he couldn't take it any longer. But I remember his talking to me about it, and he said, you know, Dick, he said, it was really worth doing. He said, uh, to see all of the blossoms that were out and to, to see the snow in the mountains, this was toward the end of the winter in March and so forth, he says, I'm awfully glad we did, even though we could only go for three days. And then a couple of days later, it was uh, my March 6th, which is the day before my mother's birthday, and he had read an ad for an electric cake mixer. Uh, which she didn't have, of course. Mm -hmm. And uh, so he said, we ought to get something for her. So we went up, I drove the car up to the Whittier Hardware store. And he could hardly walk at that point. He shouldn't have even been out of bed. And we went into the store together. We picked out the cake mixer. It cost us 30 bucks. And uh, wrapped it, birthday wrapping. We took it home and sort of hid it in the closet uh, so that she could have it the next day and we could give it to her on her birthday. The next day, I was in the bathroom shaving. The bathroom was right off of the bedroom, the downstairs bedroom where he was. And uh, he said, uh, I could hear him, he said, Dick, he said, could you hurry up? I said, I, I don't feel very well. And I said, sure. And so I finished and I got out of the room and uh, went over to college. About uh, after I'd been there two hours, I was studying in the library and the librarian, uh, a student librarian came over and said, uh, uh, Dick, you uh, folks want you to come home. Well, I knew, of course, what had happened, or assumed I did. I came home, and uh, the hearse was in front of the car from White Emerson, the same one that had been there when Arthur had died. Uh, my mother later told me uh, what had happened. After I had gone to school, he called her in, and he, who was not a very religious, he didn't appear to be, he said, well, 
He says, that's the last time I will see you. Next time I will see you in heaven. And then he went to sleep. So uh, we had, uh, I must say, uh, some rather poignant memories of those times. And then uh, didn't you gave her the, didn't you give her the, the mixer that, that night as a... We uh, gave her the mixer and uh, she took it. But of course, after that, the effect on her of losing these children, let me, let me point out something. The effect of losing Arthur was, uh, with her affection, was, uh, was very, very profound. And uh, the, the effect in losing Harold was profound because when each one of those, Leslie died first, Larry died second, the Major died third, and then Harold. And each one was if one of her own had died. Those were the people that she took care of. Those are the ones she took care of for Ed Prescott. And when Harold died, uh, it was sort of sort of the end of everything. And I remember that from that time on, March 7, which we always remember the birthday, she would never let us celebrate it. From that time on, uh, she always uh, went out to the Rose Hill Cemetery, and she put flowers in the graves. Do you remember when this photograph was taken? I would guess that I must have been 1720. You see, he looks pretty good there. Uh, that must have been a case, a time uh, before he had one of the relapses. I can't remember the exact date. How did you feel when he died? Well, it, it, the experience was traumatic for all of us. You see, we had lived uh, for 10 years, in his case, up and down with tuberculosis. Uh, and we were always hoping against hope that, you know, some cure could be found. Let me say, uh, as I look at modern medicine, uh, to me, one of the most exciting things that's happened is the cure for tuberculosis. Because my father's uh, uh, mother died with tuberculosis, Harold died with tuberculosis, uh, Arthur had tubercular meningitis, uh, and then, of course, uh, We've had uh, other experiences as well. When you went to college, your mother warned you against losing your faith. Did you? I would say in terms that she would describe it, yes. Uh, in terms that uh, both she and my father were Quakers, but fundamentalist Quakers. Uh, some of the Quakers are not too fundamentalist. They're tolerant of almost anything. Uh, but they believed in the literal interpretation of the Bible. Uh, every word of it is true, including the whale story, etc. Uh, and consequently, she was even concerned, for example, about my reading Tolstoy. Uh, she didn't think that sounded that good. Uh, of course, be a Tolstoy and a Quaker. Oh yes, I think. Yeah, not her kind of Quaker, although she was really tolerant of others, uh, tolerant. Uh, but uh, but as I say. Uh, the, the Tolstoyans and the Quakers, I think, would, would be very simpatico. Uh, at this time in, in college, one of the courses you took was, uh, I think, called the Philosophy of Christian Reconstruction, which was popularly known as What Can I Believe? Yeah, Dr. Herschel Coffin's course, that's right. And uh, the students had to uh, <coughs> write at the beginning, the middle, and the end at least three uh, relatively uh, lengthy essays on what they believed. And I guess the point was to see how the beliefs changed or progressed in the course of the, uh, of the mm -hmm. course. Uh, your mother kept, I guess, one of, the, uh, one mm -hmm. of your essays. And uh, I think you have seen this. I wonder if you could mm. read a bit of that from the, uh, I think, the last, the, the, the sum summation, or the summary e essay you wrote on oh, what yes. can I believe. Well, this is entitled The Symbolic Importance of the Resurrection Story. Uh, and I wrote that the important fact is that Jesus lived and taught a life so perfect that he continued to live and grow after his death in the hearts of men. It may be true that the resurrection story is a myth, but symbolically it teaches the great lesson that men who achieve the highest values in their lives may gain immortality. Orthodox teachers have always insisted that the physical resurrection of Jesus is the most important cornerstone in the Christian religion. I believe that the modern world will find a real resurrection in the life and teachings of Jesus. 
well, as you can tell from hearing that, that that would be inconsistent with what uh, those who believe in the literal interpretation of the Bible would say, uh, inconsistent with what my good friend uh, Billy Graham and uh, some of those who are called born-again fundamentalist Christians would say, uh, inconsistent in a literal way, uh, but not in the broadest sense, because uh, to be quite candid with you, I, uh, I would say that uh, I am not one uh, that says that everything that Darwin wrote is correct. Uh, I am not one that says that uh, it is impossible to have had uh, the theory of creation being a fact. Uh, it could have happened that way. Uh, my view is that it probably didn't happen that way, but I am certainly uh, not going to fault those who believe otherwise. Uh, so, uh, and as I see, uh, one can be a good Christian without necessarily uh, believing in the physical resurrection. Do you believe that there is a God who watches over you? Oh, yes. Who watches the things that Absolutely. you do? Absolutely. Absolutely. Oh, yes. At this time when you were in college, your Uncle Lyle came to visit. and I, I know you tell the story of his wanting yes. to, to see the sea. Well, I got to tell you who Uncle Lyle was. You know, when my father's mother died, he was shunted from place to place. And the only happy time I think he had in Ohio was with his Uncle Lyle, who uh, was his father's youngest brother. Uncle Lyle uh, was very nice to him. And so he, my father, paid the way for Uncle Lyle to come to California and spend a few days with us. He'd never been out of Ohio before that, and he had never seen the ocean. And I remember we took him down to the beach at Seal Beach, and he very much wanted to go in, because he'd never even, not even, not only been in, he'd never even seen it before. Well, we went to a place where you could rent bathing suits. And I remember uh, we got him a bathing suit. And the only kind they had was one of those old-fashioned ones that came clear down below his knees, you know. I mean, uh, like you see in the Max Senate movies. Well, we went out there. There was quite a few people on the beach. And I remember that Don and I were with him. We, we frankly were embarrassed, you know, to see Uncle Lyle. But I felt ashamed immediately there afterwards because to see him in the water jumping and hopping around uh, we shouldn't have been embarrassed or ashamed <laughs>